So I'm Fami Kadir. I founded Softcat Capital Management, which is a short-only fund based in New York and now with an office in London as well. Um, when I say short only, that means we exclusively bet against the price of companies going down. And the way we identify these potential investments is through some deep investigative work to, to find situations where a company might be misleading the market. It might be committing fraud. It might be engaged in unethical or predatory business practices. Um, and we, we conduct our analysis and then we try to find when we suspect that price discovery will happen in the market, when we can actually make our money. Um, so Sofcat, uh, th the name, is reflective of my own background. Uh, so before I became a hedge fund manager, I studied mathematics. My plan was to actually get my PhD in mathematics. And Sofcat, she is the ancient Egyptian goddess of mathematics and accounting. So it was really the perfect fit. <laughs> um, so when, when we are saying we're, we're looking to achieve alpha, um, that means that the opportunities that we're looking uh, to short, we expect the price of those securities to go down more than the inverse of the market. So if we were to take the S&P 500 and put a minus sign in front of it, we would hope that our portfolio will outperform that benchmark. And that's what we mean by alpha. When we are conducting forensic research on businesses, that means we aren't just looking at the financial statements, reading sell side reports, or listening in on earnings calls. It means that we begin with the fundamental analysis and then we continue to dive deeper. We try to identify what we feel are vulnerabilities. Some of these might be structural within the business. Some of them may be financial holes or misrepresentations that we see in their financial statements. Um, or it may just be something wrong with how that company is conducting business or portraying itself. And then we capture those vulnerabilities and then we dive deep. We really dig in. We identify what are the problems, the questions that we need to ask in order to get a, a deeper understanding. And to answer those questions, what do we need to do? Does that mean we need to go to another geography and pull private company financials? Does it mean we have to identify competitors that may offer insight and context into how a company is operating? We need to get creative, but it all starts with that initial set of questions that we, what we need to ask in order to really gain conviction in our thesis. Yeah, so never in my wildest dreams did I think I would be a hedge fund manager. In fact, it was really the opposite of anything I ever hoped to achieve in life. Uh, growing up, I was very socially progressive um, I would read Karl Marx, and I, I would be unashamed in my very liberal, very left-wing views, not just on social values, but also economic values. Um, and the way I was raised, it was always to be very passionate and value-driven. Um, so I felt that my values were really conflicted um, as far as Wall Street. And I grew up during the financial crisis, I saw my father, who was in banking, get laid off during the financial crisis. I saw the dangers of taking excessive risks and gambling with money. So for me, it was distasteful. It was something I would never do. Uh, my experience with finance actually was that when I was a teenager, Jim Simons, the founder of Renaissance Technologies, one of the best performing hedge funds of all time, um, had provided a research grant to me uh, to, to conduct research in biophysics. <laughs> Not finance, but in biophysics. So that was my first kind of intersection with finance. And that kind of came full circle after I finished undergrad um, because I became involved with the Museum of Mathematics in New York, which was funded by who other than Jim Simons of Renaissance. Um, so it was there that I realized that 
there was a path forward for me within finance that didn't mean I would have to abandon my values. In fact, I could view it as sort of taking a subversive action, using capital markets in a way to affect change, um, basically make markets fairer for all. And that's what short sellers need. They need a motivation other than money because if you think about what we do, it's inherently counter cyclical. So on, a, on the long time scale, we're always going to be up against the market. Uh, most likely, we're always going to be in a position where we will lose money. So you need to be able to find that motivation from within yourself to really have longevity in this game. So I've always been an outsider. Of course, I think we can all understand how short sellers as a group of investors are outsiders within traditional finance. But I myself am an outsider, not just within finance, but of course, even within my peer group of other short sellers. I don't believe any of them look like me and they, they certainly don't have the background that I do. Uh, I think the prevailing narrative around short sellers has always been, and I, I promise, go, go and read any profile on any of my peers that are short sellers, and it will mention testosterone or masculinity at least once. Um, so I, I come to the table with different perspectives. Um, the way I was raised was to never, uh, never take no for an answer, um, to really go and fight for what I want, what I see is right, and to pay it forward. So I've never, in this entire journey, um, from an academic researcher to becoming a hedge fund manager and a short seller, over that entire period, I never compromised on what I always was and what I am. My core values have always remained the same, and that's the guiding light. Uh, when I'm making an investment decision, when something is going against me, when people are telling me that I'm wrong, I just remember my roots. I, I'm driven by my beliefs, by my values, and by my work. And when I can rely upon all of that, then I can have a clear mind. So, we'll come back to those the seeds of conviction. So, it's funny because the, the type of math that I studied has zero relevance to financial markets. Uh, it, it's what we would call paper math. Uh, the kind of math that exists for purposes we still don't really understand. Uh, it's math for the fun of math. Um, so the thing that I value the most about my strong foundation in, in mathematics is that it is about finding the most elegant answer. It is always about asking the right questions, finding the right pieces of fact for your proof, and coming up with something that is just purely simple, something that is elegant. Um, and that's what I'm driven, you know, how my research is really driven. Because even if I spend hundreds or thousands of hours investigating a specific business, I should be able to explain to you why I am short that company in a single sentence. It should really be simple. Um, because at the end of the day, we're talking about very simple things. We're talking about people and we're talking about money and it should never be something that requires a hundred pages of explanation. Um, you make it sound very uh, simple, but it's not. Uh, very short. So uh, with Valiant, it began before I even became a short seller. Um, prior to my, my shorting Valiant, I was in corporate intelligence, specifically within the pharmaceutical industry. And I was asked uh, to create a model for one of my clients, which was a top five global pharmaceutical company, to create a model that would predict when a specific drug would go into shortage. So some of this was data driven, you know, numbers um, and understanding that, but it was also building a, a source network across factories for all sorts of companies all over the world, for chemicals, for drugs. And the model eventually got very good at predicting these shortages. So, of course, then I'm going to my client, making recommendations of how they can change their manufacturing lines um, to ensure that there is going to be supply to meet these shortages. But that isn't what the client did, no. 
Um, instead, all they did in those situations would be increase the price of the drugs to the point where in the company's annual budget, they would have a line dedicated to the opportunistic revenue that was driven by this specific model. Um, and that was the, the, the rage moment for me. Um, and it really carried through to my understanding of healthcare and the pharmaceutical industry. Um, because the reality is pharmaceutical companies more than most corporations exist to serve us. So if ultimately what these companies are doing is harming their end customer, us, then there's a problem. And that is gonna be damaging to your business to your bottom line. So while everyone that was short valiant, they were looking at all sorts of financial engineering, acquisition accounting, debt, I was looking at it more simply. Valiant built their business model on acquiring drugs, raising the price to the point where if you looked at those drugs over their lifetime, once Valiant ac acquired them and raised the price, people could no longer afford them and Valiant could no longer sell those drugs. At some point, when your balance sheet is so upside down, you can't keep this going. And it was that simple. The, the simple business model was broken. Um, so yeah, it is, it is that simple, I would argue. <laughs> it's, it's, it's trying to take lots of information and basically parse out what is the most important and critical thing to the business's existence. I would say that Wirecard, again, is a case of existential faults within the business model. This was a business that started out one way, which was high-risk payment processing, but after Wirecard obtained a banking license, it became much bigger than any company that ever conducted high-risk payment processing. There was something fundamentally broken with their business model. It just simply didn't make sense. What they were saying they did wasn't actually what the numbers were showing. So you have to then try to understand why is this happening? Well, in our thesis from the evidence that we were collecting was that this was driven by money laundering because money laundering gives you lots of volumes and the risks that come with high risk payment processing don't really exist with money laundering um, because no one is gonna cry foul against themselves so um, once we realized that this was happening, what we had to understand was these, you know, at what point are the risks too great to the individuals who are laundering money through Wirecard? Because the point at which those individuals start pulling their funds out of the system is the point at which Wirecard will likely collapse. That's, that's when all of the, the house of cards will simply collapse because the money is no longer there to basically inflate the, the business. It's all really about timing. I think with Wirecard, um, I had to really get a sense of, uh, this was a, like Valiant, Wirecard was a case where for over a decade, individuals had very good cases against the company and all of them lost significant amounts of money over that entire period. So in both situations, I knew I had to come to the story with a fresh pair of eyes. Um, I needed to look at things in a different kind of way. Um, I needed to look at what has changed in the story over that period of time that might actually prove critical uh, to the company's downfall. Um, but so it was really about understanding that timing, understanding what new can be done rather than simply relying on the same story that's been told time and time again. Um, but then the other thing that I learned, and you know, I learn this more and more every day, is that you can never be too paranoid um, you, as far as the lengths that issuers will go uh, to basically stop the work that you do. With Valiant, I knew that Valiant had lawyers who were building up you know, a file on me and other short sellers. I only knew this after the fact, um, through the class action lawsuits and all of that. Um, but, you know, I was, I was sort of naive to the idea that this could happen. But, of course, you know, with Wirecard, it was a lot more nefarious. There was hacking. There was actual physical surveillance. So uh, you realize that 
there's definitely risks involved in this game and you just always have to be careful. You have to always be skeptical and on your toes. I tend to filter out any noise that gets in the way of my objectives. Um, I, I don't know if it's because I'm the youngest in my entire family, uh, but when, when people are against me, when they say I'm the most reviled investor, when they say that what I do is despicable, it just doesn't stick. Um, I know that a lot of this comes from just basic human psychology. Most people out there don't understand what I do, and they, they can't really get their head around the idea that I am making bets against businesses that I believe are conducting fraud. Um, because none of us want to believe that we can be defrauded or lied to. Um, so I don't think any amount of PR or you know, goodwill that I can develop over my lifetime will ever change the public perception of short sellers. This is something that is as old as there's been a market. As, you know, as long as there's been a market, there's been a short seller. And as long as that's been the case, people have hated the short seller. So I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Um, I just don't let it get to me. So that's the negative media attention that you've been getting. At the same time, there's been support as well. The media is critical to what I do because I believe they are the most effective and most credible storyteller. Um, that is their job. And if I can get a journalist to see my thesis and independently corroborate my work, then that just gives me greater conviction that what I've come across, the conclusions that I've made, aren't you know, simply my bias um, or my cynicism. There's something real here. So I really respect the job that journalists do. I think it's very much aligned um, with what I do as a short seller, um, but I, I understand the separation. Um, journalists, they're motivated by their reputation and, you know, short sellers were motivated by money. So obviously that's going to change how we go about doing things, but I respect the line. Um, I don't see myself as a journalist. Um, I'm, I'm an investor. I'm a market participant. Yeah, so I've worked very hard to ensure that I can go to a conference and exist as a short seller where everyone in the room knows that I'm a short seller, but I'm still invited and allowed to exist in those spaces um, because I believe there is value. There is value in speaking with management and seeing how they react simply to my presence. Um, so be because I actually am not going out, I'm not publishing any of my work um, because I'm not speaking disparagingly um, in public uh, outlets, I think companies are a lot more amenable to engaging with me on the questions that I might have. Uh, I think they would rather be receptive and friendly and see if they could perhaps convince me that I'm wrong um, than simply ignore me. Because if, if they ignore me and, and they know that I'm not going to go out of my way to, to make, a, make noise or make a fuss, then there's, it's probably going to make me dig even deeper. Um, so, so generally, uh, I think even though everyone knows that I'm a short seller now, I think it's, it hasn't negatively affected my work. Um, in fact, it's allowed me to have a more constant stream of ideas because journalists, whistleblowers, everyone is more willing to engage with me. They understand my reputation. Uh, so it puts me in a better position to do my work. Generally, banning short selling is sort of this emotional, reactionary, sort of mechanism that some regulators may lean on when there's chaos, there's crisis in the markets, and they don't really understand what they can do to stop it. It's sort of a feel-good thing 
that they can show to the public, the general public, you know, see, we're doing something about the markets collapsing. We're banning the short sellers. You know, we'll even bring them in front of Congress and have them testify. Uh, but the reality is most regulators are very educated, intellectual people. They understand exactly what short selling is and the role that short selling plays in the market. Um, so in these moments where they reach for things like short selling bans, it's purely political. Um, it's purely reactionary and regulators should know better because the data time and time again has shown that restricting short selling activity is actually harmful for markets and harmful for price discovery, for liquidity. The thing is with market crisis, when stocks are in free fall, who is the natural buyer? It's me because I have to cover my shorts. Um, so banning short sales never makes sense. I think at least in the Western world, in developed markets, it isn't going to be something we, we will see happen again in the way we did during the financial crisis. I think everyone realizes it was a mistake. Um, the wire card case of sh banning short sales, again, I think that's something that is being investigated. How did this come to be? What were the motivations there? Was it because of regulatory capture? Um, but again, I think Germany also will not do this again. I think they realized that they should never have done it in the first place. And I even got apologies from those within the Ministry of Finance in Germany about the entire debacle. Um, so it's my hope that at least in, you know, in Europe, in the US, we, we, we know better and, and we won't resort to, to bans or any o onerous kind of regulations on short sellers. I think it, once there is a big public financial scandal, that's in the aftermath of that is usually when regulators take a much harder stance on fraud um, and corporate crime in general. So in the aftermath of Wirecard, Germany has totally revamped its securities regulator, Boffin. Um, it brought in a new head who I have a lot of respect for. They've implemented new um, protocols for people like me to get in touch with them with actual materials and evidence, and they've been on it. Anytime there's even been a headline, the securities regulator in Germany has now come out and said that they will investigate. Um, so it's actually definitely been positive. Now, whether this will carry through another market cycle, that remains to be seen. My, my motivations are, of course, greater than just capital markets. So wherever I can lend my expertise, my advice, my labor, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do so, even if it means it's outside of public markets. Um, so a lot of the journalists we engage with are not just the ones that write for mainstream financial publications, but also those that might be involved with things like the Paradise Papers. Um, because again, there is a lot of synergy between people who are using black box jurisdictions and tax havens with individuals who invest or engage in corporate crime in the public markets. Um, so personally, I'm always motivated to look at things like transparency and corruption, even if that means if we solve these problems, I, I'll probably have less work to do. Um, but you know, this isn't just about my work and my ability to find things to short. It is ultimately about having a fairer economy, a more transparent economy globally. How do you compare working in short selling? So I think um, since I've moved to London, it's a much smaller community uh, than New York is. New York is very professional. Everyone's, you know, very much suited. Um, you have the frequent investor dinners and idea sharing, and it's a lot of, um, let's say, peacocking. Um, whereas I think in London, things are a bit more casual. It's a much smaller environment. Um, there are fewer people who are doing what I do. Um, so you tend to hear things. There's a lot more gossip, um, but there's also, I think, more 
sincerity in, in actually going about doing the research and doing the work um, because things sort of happen on a different level than in New York. Um, so for that, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating it. Uh, it's, it's charming being a short seller in London.